So uh, Ola's assignment to me when we talked about doing this talk was uh, not to do a closure tutorial nor to do a closure cheerleading session, but to talk about our experience uh, actually using closure in commercial development. Uh, all that tutorial and cheerleading stuff is available online at my GitHub account. So there is an enormous slide deck up there. It's about 200 slides now. That's a lot of uh, tutorial information on Clojure. Uh, you can go take a look at that uh, if you're interested. Uh, given that this is about experience, I'm going to talk for a minute about Relevance. Uh, Relevance is an agile shop. We are uh, 11 full-time developers and uh, five or six contractors occasionally. Uh, we work in an agile war room. Uh, that's us. That's my uh, Captain Kirk chair. Uh, <laughs> up at the front there. And uh, we have been in business since 2003. Uh, we got our start primarily doing uh, Spring and Hibernate uh, type development in the Java platform. In 2005, we made a hard turn uh, to Ruby and Rails. And uh, in 2008 and now 2009, we're in the midst of making a hard turn uh, towards closure. Uh, I mention all of this to give you some idea of what our level of risk averseness or risk tolerance is so that you can compare that uh, to your own organization. Uh, the things that we've been building in Clojure, uh, we've been doing uh, rule-based systems. That feels kind of good and lispy and that makes sense. Uh, we've been doing social networking applications. So uh, Web 2.0, uh, HTTP, blah, blah, blah. So you know, competing with, say, Rails is sweet spot. Uh, scalable web services, and we can talk about um, what notion of scale that implies, and some near real-time uh, simulation work. Uh, before we talk about uh, these applications and the pain and pleasure that we've had in putting them together and shipping them, I am going to take 10 minutes to talk about why Clojure. And this is based on the notion that uh, of the languages being presented today, Clojure might be a bit more foreign to some, uh, although we did have a good show of hands for people with Clojure and Lisp experience. Um, I'm going to give four short elevator pitches for why Clojure might be interesting uh, as distinct from other languages. Uh, the first one is that Clojure is a lisp. And there's no way to do this justice in one minute or five or 50. So I'm going to refer you to Paul Graham, who has done a pretty good job with this. Uh, his article on uh, why lisp is great uh, has been very uh, meaningful to me and I think a lot of other people in the industry in driving the kinds of things that we've been interested in learning. Uh, I think that the industry norm right now gets about four of the nine things that are cool about Lisp. I think that the cool kids, people that are doing you know, Ruby or Python or whatever, or JavaScript, uh, get about seven of the nine. And uh, I was really interested in this last one, uh, homo iconicity, and what that makes possible. Uh, without doing the full tutorial on why this is cool, uh, if you're interested in metaprogramming, eventually you're going to be in love with Lisp. And if metaprogramming has never been interesting to you at all, then this is going to be irritating parenthesis to you. right? And so uh, the notion of going to Clojure as opposed to some other language, uh, this is going to be a cost to you, not a benefit. Uh, but if you've found yourself in a situation where you have 10,000 lines of code and you could make 5,000 of them go away if you could generalize some particular thing that's not generalized in your language, uh, then that's why Lisp and homo iconicity are important. Uh, the second reason to use Clojure, and this really applies to, I think, all the other languages that are being discussed on this track today as well, is that Clojure uh, moves you above assembly language for the JVM. You guys are familiar with assembly language for the JVM. It's called Java. Uh, it's, it's a very low level language uh, for doing work on the JVM, and it takes a lot of syntax and bureaucracy to get things done. Uh, Clojure's Java interop is very tastefully done. Uh, if you can look past the parentheses, creating Java objects is trivial. Uh, accessing static members in Java is trivial. Accessing instance members in Java is trivial. Uh, and th for those of you who are scared, uh, using Clojure idiomatically requires fewer parentheses than Java. So one thing you may want to tell your friends if they ask, why are you checking out this Clojure thing? Well, you know, I used to be a Java programmer, but I got tired of all the damned parentheses. <laughs> Uh, Clojure's atomic data types uh, line up with atomic data types in Java. Again, as in common with most of the other newfangled languages on the JVM, uh, we sort of default to do math correctly, right? So in Clojure, a big number plus a big number equals a big number, as opposed to you know in Java where a big number plus a big number 
equals a small number, unless you actually upgrade to one of those big number classes. So there's a lot of uh, you know, nice affordances here. Again, there's not a lot here that's different from a lot of other uh, new languages on the JVM. A third reason to be interested in Clojure is that it's functional. And this is a multifaceted thing. First off, I'm going to characterize functional programming. I'm not going to define it. Uh, that's like trying to start a bar fight. So, uh, and I'm going to characterize it in a couple of ways. Uh, the first one is that you know, traditionally, a lot of programs are written in an imperative style. This is uh, from the uh, Apache Commons. This is how do I figure out is a string blank in a UI sense. And it turns out that a string is blank in a UI sense if it is null or if its length is 0, or if for all of its length, all the pieces of it are white space. And imperative style would have you write this uh, with loops and so forth. I don't think this is beautiful Java style, even as imperative Java. But this, I, I think you know, if it's in, in the Apache Commons, we can argue that it's idiomatic, uh, if not beautiful. Uh, functional style sees these things as higher order functions. So a string is blank if for every character in that string, that character is white space. This is a Java interop form where the percent is the argument to an anonymous function. Uh, the pound is shortcut syntax for introducing anonymous functions. And then s is the argument. Uh, this function is applied once to each character of s as necessary. Uh, obviously, this is a lot shorter. Uh, it also takes advantage of ignoring the distinction between nil and empty. Uh, Clojure gives us the option of doing that, or we can pay attention to that distinction if we want to. Uh, I'm a big fan of ignoring that distinction for cases like this, because it's just getting rid of a case that I would have to worry about. A second piece uh, of being functional is having a very small set of data types that you work with. This is more of an implication uh, of thinking functionally in a dynamic language than it is you know, part of a definition. Uh, in Clojure, we have four major data literals. We have lists, vectors, maps, and sets. Uh, for those of you who have a Lisp background, commas in Clojure are white space. Right? So if it really makes you feel better to put commas between the things in a vector and make it look like array syntax from another language, you're welcome to do that. Uh, Clojure won't care. It turns out that this piece, we'll come back to this later, this limiting yourself to a small set of data types actually seems scary. Right? The whole notion of object-oriented programming is that every pro new problem needs a new data type. Or, in fact, that most new problems need a dozen new data types. Right? I need a person, and a person DAO, and a person DTO, and a person utils, right? and a person this, that, and the other. Right? We need a, a zillion data types in our language to represent one data type in the problem domain. Uh, Clojure takes that in the opposite direction. Right? We're going to have far fewer data types, per se, that, you know, that we declare in the language. But the other piece of this is that these data structures are persistent. Uh, and I don't mean that they, they irritatingly nudge you all the time, uh, nor do I mean that they are persistent in the sense of being saved to a database. They are persistent in the sense that they're immutable. They can't change, uh, which has a lot of benefits. Right? It turns out that it's very easy to reason about programs when things can't change. Right? If things can change, then it's like you have to speculatively execute programs in your head to understand how they work, something that we're not very good at. Um, persistent data structures are changed, in quotes, by application of functions and all the old versions of a persistent data structure are around if you need them. So I can be looking at a slightly aged version of a data structure that you're currently modifying. Now, how many people are familiar with the double checked locking is broken issue in the Java world? Right? Uh, in Clojure and in any language that has persistent data structures done right, uh, you don't have to coordinate to read. Right? Which is why we worried about the whole double check locking thing to begin with, because it seems like you shouldn't have to coordinate to read. Right? The people that got in trouble with that in the Java world were wrong on the technical details of how the JVM worked, but they were right in their instinct that in reality, reading doesn't require coordination. And that's true with Clojure's uh, data structures as well. Now, the trick here is making this work. And without building up to it, I'll just go to the punchline. Uh, Clojure's data structures are implemented using 32-way trees. And what this allows you to do, like trees can have shared structure. Right? So I can have a tree that, has, that looks like a hash map from an API perspective that has 1,000 things in it. And you can have a tree that has 1,500 things in it. And all the things that are in common are shared. Right? So we actually get the performance guarantees uh, of a hash map almost. Uh, and the almost is, are we OK with this? Right? This should be Clojure's slogan. Because right? log32n is fast enough. 
right? That's close enough to constant for the size of things that we work with that using a tree instead of a map under the covers is fast enough. And this, for this trade-off, what do we get? Right? We get immutable data structures. And with immutable data structures, we now have the ability to bang on them from 32 cores or from 128 cores right? without having to worry about coordinating access. That leads us to the fourth thing, which is wrongly thought of as a concurrency problem, but it's really a problem about state in general. Right? In a pure functional language, uh, everything is functions, right? And your processor just heats up and nothing ever happens. Uh, in the real world, though, things do happen. And so we have a notion of change over time. Right? State really implies time. Right? In, in a pure functional environment, there is no state. And if I ask a question, I can ask it again later and I'll get the same answer. If I ask a question of some piece of code and I ask it again later and I get a different answer, then I have state. And traditionally, the way we've de dealt with this is mutable object-oriented programming. And so we have these identities, which are going to be called the this pointer or self or whatever you want to call it. And these identity pointers point to something, but that something isn't very well defined. Right? That something could be an immutable atomic value, like an integer. Or it could be a maybe immutable atomic value, like a long. Right? So sometimes it's immutable or sometimes it's not, depending on the, the processor architecture. Or maybe it's a compound piece of data, like a string, which is immutable. Or maybe it's a compound piece of data, like a string buffer, which is mutable. So the thing that this points to is kind of ill-defined. And where does that become really obvious? Well, as soon as more than one thread starts to talk to this thing. Right? More than one thread starts to talk to this thing, and then maybe you can see you know, in-flight results, right? non-atomic behavior when you look at a data structure. Uh, and you have to worry about coordinating access with everybody else. And so we have this problem that we don't have a, a clear I idea of what identities point to. And because of that problem, we get a, a worse problem, which is locks. Right? We have to use locks to kind of try to deal with that. Uh, Clojure breaks this logjam by saying that our values are pure values and our identities are separate objects. So in Clojure, all the data that you've seen before, all the maps and vectors and lists and so forth, that you would be accustomed to mutating in a lot of languages, those are immutable. And then the identities are mutable references to those things. And every identity in Clojure has explicit semantics associated with update. And those semantics are thread safe. Right? So there's no way to write a program that willy-nilly is mutable here and immutable there and create a big mess and then go back and try to put locks on it to bandage over the problems and fix it later. Uh, it just works out of the gate. And some terms uh, in Clojure, a value is immutable data in a persistent data structure. An identity is a series of causally related values over time. Right? This is a perception thing. This is something that emerges from observing a system. Right? I look at a system and I look at it later and I see that something has changed. Right? And that something is identity. The identity now points to uh, something at a point in time and then a different something later. At an API level, this is super easy to use. Uh, this is a thread safe chat database. So I'm going to have some sort of, you know, you can log in and post a message. And so I'm going to keep a list of messages. So there's an empty list for our initial state. And then I'm going to wrap them in an identity. So this is one of several identity types in Clojure. I can then Update that identity. So here's a function that adds a message to the database. Updates must be inside a transaction. And they generally proceed by applying. So alter says apply some function. In this case, conjoin is a function which is going to add something to a list. Uh, add it to whatever is contained inside of messages. So this messages is not data. This is a reference. And then we're going to add this piece of data to the collection. And the result of the transaction, which is the result of alter and the result of this function, is the, the new current value of this thing. In some sense, and this is subtle, right? do think, well, how is that different from lock? Right? But the semantics are very different. Because uh, what happens if I compose a bunch of things inside of a do sync? Right? If I have four things that need to change atomically together, I just put them inside a transaction. And that just works. It just works in the same way a transaction in Oracle just works. And in fact, the implementation details, minus the fact that it's not persistent, uh, this is an in-memory transaction, are actually pretty similar to what Oracle does, multi-version concurrency control. What happens if you compose a system where you have locks? Right? Object A has locks, object B has locks, object C has locks. I throw them together in a system. What happens? Deadlocks. Deadlocks. Undefined behavior. And how do we solve that problem? 
Right? The way that we have solved it historically, a couple things we do. One, we, we solve it through heroism. Right? So some really smart person gets the entire mental model of all the state in the, pro in the program in their head at once, and they get a global lock ordering in their head, and they make sure deadlocks don't happen. The other way that we solve it is we take a very limited snapshot of the kinds of things you might want to do with state and enforce them via a framework. Right? So you're, and it's the interesting thing, right? In the Java world, almost every framework, no matter what it does, starts by telling you that you can't use any of Java's concurrency features while you're in the framework. Right? You're not allowed to use locks. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to have instance methods. And then you get all kinds of weird ass rules, right? Like you're near your servlet API, or you can't use this, that, or the other thing because of the concurrency model. And that's because that frameworks are trying to solve a problem that was left unsolved in the language. Uh, Clojure aspires to solve these problems at the language level. So there are, in short, four reasons why Clojure is interesting. Right? It is a lisp, which as I said before, you know, people are going to take different perspectives on. It's an effective language for interoperating with Java. It's functional, and it has a, in my opinion, sane model for dealing with state. Um, we're now going to flip over to talking about what it's been like putting this stuff into production on real systems. But before I do that, does anybody want to ask any questions about the language itself? This is your last chance. Yes, here. So if uh, you're dealing with uh, dependent Java objects, how do you handle that? If they may be having Java objects that aren't thread safe. It's a very good question. So uh, at the doorway to the closure world, you can choose to have Java objects reify themselves into the closure way of thinking. So any Java collection, if you start touching it from Clojure, it's going to get seeked. It's going to get converted into a Clojure sequence that's going to reify immutably on that side of the world. Right? That doesn't solve the problem, though. Right? Uh, that, sort, I mean, that solves the problem if you're careful. Because you still have to worry about the fact that the Java collection that you're dealing with on the other side is still mutable. It could still change. You won't see changes to it. Uh, and so right, one way that you could use Clojure is like as a scripting language for Java and not embrace the immutability of Clojure and continue to work with mutable Java objects that way. Uh, we've done that not at all. Right? So we've made a decision that we're going to use Clojure as God intended. Right? Not use Clojure as, because I think that would suck. Right? You would lose a, a major benefit of language. But, but Clojure does have defense mechanisms. There's also a function in Clojure called Bean. And if you call bean on a Java bean, boom, it gets zapped into an immutable map. And so you can, at the doorway between Java and Clojure, you know, bandage the problems. Uh, but the problems are, you know, the problems are still going to remain. Uh, I don't recommend that style. And if I were going to use, if I were going to be doing Java interop in that style, I would be inclined to pick a different language. And there was another question in the back. Yes. We did consider Scala. So those, those of you who don't know me personally, hi, I'm Stuart. Uh, I did a series of blog posts on Java languages. I did Scala, Groovy, Ruby, and Clojure. That was part of our internal decision process of what language to choose. Uh, let me just say that I think all four of them have their appropriate niche. Um, I picked Clojure as the primary place I wanted to go personally because I think that, I, initially because I thought the list stuff was cool. And then once I got into it, because I thought that the state approach was cool. Right? So I, I, you know, it, was, it, it delivered more than I expected it to uh, when I went and looked at it. All those other languages delivered every bit of what I expected they would deliver. And they're all you know, being used by people happily in real world applications. Also, I should say that 70% of the 11 people in my company are having a heart attack right now when they watch this video, uh, hearing you phrase the question in terms of when we stopped doing Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> We did not stop doing Ruby. Probably 80% probably of our work at this second is in Ruby, and 20% uh, is in Clojure. Right? I would say that there's a, the, the subset of things that I would write Java code for is vanishingly small at this point. I mean, the, the assembly language thing is not just a, 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 a one-liner. Uh, I can't imagine what I would write Java for. The few things that I would need to write Java for, I would prefer Scala, because it, it has, you know, to the metal compilation, uh, for most things, and uh, a lot more expressiveness. So there's very little I'd use Java for, but all these other languages absolutely uh, you know, make sense uh, for, you know, in different settings. Yes? So the language has been evolving. Has that been a problem? Uh, let me hold that question. So, so now that the questions are moving from the language to you know, what our experience has been, we'll, we'll hit that one as we go. So 
one of the things that is an ongoing issue is what is it like to do test-driven development or behavior-driven development in a functional programming language? Uh, the FP folks have their own way of thinking about this stuff, easy check and quick check uh, style testing. And the TDD folks uh, have their way of thinking about it. We are very much a TDD and BDD shop. And so we wanted to have a testing uh, solution that worked. And this has been a pain point. It has been good enough, but it hasn't been perfect. And, and where it's problematic, and this is a question that I encourage all of you to think about for yourselves. When you're learning a new programming language, at what point is your skill in the language good enough that you're effective writing tests or doing TDD? And I actually think that that's a, a point that comes kind of late, right? That you're effective, you know, and I went through this when I was writing the book. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a TDD guy. You know, chapter two will be the unit testing framework. And then for the whole rest of the book, we're going to write code that's unit tested the rest of the way. And I ended up not doing that at all. I ended up putting the, the unit testing at the very end of the book because I didn't find it to be a good way to learn Clojure. And I've thought about this a bit, and I don't really think that's specific to Clojure. I think that anytime you're learning a language that's a paradigm shift, you're going to be ineffective writing tests at the beginning. And so one of the real pain points has been that our team at Relevance has not been strong at writing tests. And they feel that very keenly because they're strong at that uh, on other stuff. And so we've had to sort of cope with that. Uh, we have coped with that. And all of our code is tested. And so we're, you know, we're, we're living our values. But it hurt. Right? It was hard to do. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of what test syntax looks like. This is Clojure's built-in test framework. And so the R macro takes a set of arguments, and then it says this next statement is true for all pairs of those arguments. So in this particular case, this is from, some of you may have read the uh, Brian's Brain simulation blog posts in the Clojure world. This is a uh, cellular automaton like Conway's Game of Life, right? So the cells you know, change shape over time. And what I wanted to do in these tests was demonstrate that you could actually have a visual test. So if you have one cell that has no neighbors, the next state is dying. If you have a, state, a cell that's currently not alive that has four neighbors that are alive, then it's already dead and it stays dead. And if the cell is not alive right now, but it has two living neighbors and six that are in the process of dying, then that's actually the rule. This actually captures the primary rule in, the game of, in this particular game of life variant, which is if you have two living neighbors, you're going to come to life. right? You're going to be birthed. And so this is part of a test suite for uh, the simulation. Uh, the R macro is really quite cool for doing a table of possible inputs and values. Uh, that actually feels good compared to other testing frameworks. Uh, but overall, you know, we struggled to be effective with the testing framework for a while. And in fact, Clojure.test was not in Clojure when we started. Uh, I actually got involved in the Clojure community significantly to push this into Clojure. So what happened when we first started working on this, you know, this was six or seven months ago, uh, we were at a point where if you wanted to submit a bug report with Clojure, you actually had to write a test that was in one Git repository and a patch for Clojure that would be committed to another repository and submit two patches, right? which was an incredible barrier to people making contributions. So we solved that problem uh, by, by getting Clojure.test in there. I don't think this is a done deal. I think that there are people that are interested in you know, doing BDD framework work in Clojure. So uh, this isn't going to go away, and you know, maybe this will get better over time. It's good enough now. Uh, I don't think, you know, just to be opinionated, uh, I think that Ruby pretty much kicks everybody else's ass at approaches to testing uh, with RSpec and Cucumber and, and the adoption there. And so that's something we've missed. Uh, and, and we haven't seen, you know, it's good in Clojure compared to, to some places, but it's not as good as it could be. The second issue that we hit and this one probably bothered me more than other people on the team, was the whole issue of whether or not you wrap Java APIs. Right? One of the things about being in another language on the JVM is the first thing you're going to do is like, ooh, Java icky. Right? We're going to wrap the APIs everywhere we can. And Clojure has not taken that approach. Right? Rich Hickey, the creator of the language, has said, you know, look, uh, we want to have really close to the metal performance when we need it. Right? You can add, actually add reflective type hints in anywhere in Clojure, and so it compiles down at the method call level to the same method call you'd get if you wrote your code in Java. So that aspect of performance is, is a solved problem if you want it. And that mindset is you know, that we're going to call Java. So if I want to instantiate a Java file, I can say java.io.file dot, which creates new ones. Or there's this helper function as file, which wraps it. And so there's, the, there's two things. I mean, one, should this have even been done? Right? Should this kind of wrapping be done? Um, 
I actually wrote this. This is in Clojure Contrib, so I've, I've voted on this particular issue. It makes me absolutely stinking crazy that there's a whole bunch of things in the Java world that have a string representation, but you can't just pass around strings. Right? Files have to be files, and URLs have to be URLs, and so forth. So I've written those wrapper functions. Where this bites you further, though, is, again, getting back to the testing. Uh, if you're going to do mock objects, right, there is a closure mocking framework. Mocking in a Lisp is beautiful. Right? Bind this value to some different function for this scope, and you're done. Like Literally, you could have a poor person's mocking framework. The poor person's mocking framework is you know, rebinding a variable on this thread to point to a different function is a language feature. Right? Generally true in a Lisp and, and true in closure. Uh, and there's a, a, a lightweight. Uh, mocking and stubbing framework that builds on top of that. And yes, there are issues across threads, and do you want to bind it across all threads if you're doing a multi-threaded test and so forth. But uh, I don't think that's a super easily solved thing uh, in other languages either. Uh, but where it really bites you is if you want to mock out some of the Java stuff. And so, because the minute you want have to mock the Java stuff, then you have to drag in one of the Java mocking libraries. You got to bring in, I don't even know what they're called anymore. Um, Makito, I guess, is probably the most, you know, the most popular one. Uh, so what we did was we chose to take an approach of whenever we found ourselves needing to mock something in Java, we went ahead and wrapped it so that we could mock it at the closure ne level, not at the Java level, because I didn't want to bring in Makito. Uh, that's a personal bias uh, on my side. Having spent several years in Ruby and Python and JavaScript and now Clojure, I just can't read Java code. So it's just too. What's that? How did you test the wrappers? You know, it's not perfect. <laughs> right, this is an experience report, so some things are good and, and some things are bad. And the other issue here is the learning curve. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that uh, of the dynamic languages that you could run on the JVM, that Python and Ruby and JavaScript and Groovy are all easier to learn than Clojure. Right? Uh, whether or not Scala or Clojure is easier to learn is an interesting question and worth arguing about. Uh, and I have. Um, I have actually a definitive opinion on that, but I'm not going to share it right now. <laughs> you can come talk to me afterwards at the bar. Uh, but both Scala and Clojure are hard to learn uh, in different ways. And so you know, uh, we were one of the reasons that we took the company from a two-person company to an 11-person company was that at that size, we were just big enough to try things and take risks and say, let's put Stu on a, sab a sabbatical for four months to learn Clojure and write a book about it and you know, decide which language we're going to use next. That's great. Now we do have a problem, which I don't like at all, which is that I'm a single point of failure uh, on closure projects, right? That, that people want my input on closure projects. And we have enough closure projects running right now that that kind of pulls me in multiple directions, right? And they're not happy I'm here right now, right? They want me to be in the office, which. So uh, this is a hard problem, and I won't sugarcoat it, right? There's more to learn that's new in closure. Uh, than there is in just going to a dynamic language on the JVM. Right? Switching over to a functional style isn't trivial. Uh, the model that Clojure has for dealing with state is arguably revolutionary uh, in the industry, and that's, that is going to take some learning as well. Now, the things that we did to mitigate that, um, hey, look, pair programming solves yet another problem. Right? Uh, we pair on all development anyway, or almost all development. Uh, we also do uh, open source Fridays. So you know, Google had this great idea several years ago about having engineers have 20% scratch your itch time. Uh, we have 20% scratch your itch time. And so a couple of other guys on the team uh, have stepped up. The other mitigating factor here is that the Clojure community on the internet, and obviously it's small and growing fast, so this could change, absolutely effing rocks. Right? Uh, you know, Rich Hickey hangs out on IRC and answers your questions. This is really cool. And so the ability to get help and support, and if you're an open source zealot, and probably many of you here are, uh, you know, you're used to, to good open source projects having great, great free support. And that has been really good. And so the learning curve has been hard uh, knowing where pieces are. You know, one thing that's a problem is that you go and write something, and you spend half an hour writing something, and then somebody taps you on the shoulder and says, you know, there's a function that does that. Right? And so being able to find those things. And candidly, and I'll say this from a perspective as someone who's a consultant selling services, but also if I put myself on the other side of that as a project owner or a project manager, I don't mind that. I don't mind if when developers are learning the language that as a training wheels moment that they end up writing something that they didn't have to. Right? As long as 
once they figure it out, they don't leave their bespoke half crap implementation you know, lying around. Oh, there's a function that does that in the standard library. Let's switch over. Right? We know that we're learning something new. I don't mind that we're writing code that we throw away. And I think that's true in, in domains as well. Right? You're learning a problem domain usually when you're writing code. And you, know, you end up writing code that gets thrown away. So that's OK. The other thing I want to talk about is libraries. So obviously, by being on, a JV, uh, being on the JVM, we have access to all the Java libraries. Kind of a mixed blessing. right? It's not necessarily the case that we want all of them. Um, a couple of libraries that you should definitely be aware of if you're going to go and do Clojure development. There is a library called Namespace Utils that has a bunch of helper functions for exploring namespaces. The namespace management uh, at a conceptual level is really cool. At an API level, it's painful. And so you know, you're going to want to spend time learning that stuff. And that's actually been true in every Lisp I've ever worked in. And I don't have a huge amount of experience in other Lisps, but I found the namespace stuff to be conceptually cool but irritating to get my head around the, the mechanics uh, of dealing with it. Uh, Clojure has a pretty print library. Uh, Clojure, is, Clojure code is Clojure data. And so you live a lot in Clojure's data syntax. And so being able to look at it pretty printed matters. Um, there's a set of REPL utils. So when you are at the interactive shell, everyone has heard the term REPL before, read, eval, print loop. Um, that's what shells should be called because the Lisp guys were there first. But no one seems to have adopted their nomenclature anywhere else. Uh, but there are tools at the REPL for bringing up Javadoc. Uh, show will show you everything an object can do. So this is at the Java level, like all the methods that an object supports, whether it's a Java object or a Clojure object. Uh, and source will uh, take you straight to the source. Uh, Clojure has a library called sequence utils. Uh, all of the data structures in Clojure uh, support a common abstraction called the sequence library. And the sequence library, and this kind of a vague term, I think of the sequence library as all of the sequence functions in Clojure itself, plus all of the sequence functions in here, plus any other functions that build on top of that basic contract that I or anybody else happens to write. And the notion here uh, is really sort of one noun to rule them all, right? to paraphrase Sauron. Uh, that, that all of our things are written in terms of this API, and there's a rich set of functions that can work with sequences. And once you know these, a, a remarkable number of problems do not require the introduction of new nouns. Right? We don't add lots of nouns to the system. Uh, shell out lets you call the host operating system. And then string utils. Uh, Rich Hickey, the creator of Clojure, is not a big fan of regular expressions. So they get kind of short shrift. They're supported, and there's a literal for them. So it's not as bad as Java. But, uh, but it's not much better than that. And so the rest of regular expressions, if you care about that sort of stuff, uh, lives in stir utils. Other libraries that we've used, uh, Composure Rocks. Composure is a web framework that is inspired by Ruby's Sinatra. We've used that for all the stuff that we've done to support web endpoints. Uh, I think James Reeves, the guy who created Composure, has a very tasteful style writing Clojure code. Uh, and that's a hard thing to do. Because it, you know, what is tasteful Clojure right now? The, the language is young and evolving. Uh, I like James as a, uh, as a reference point for style. And when I'm not sure how to do something, a lot of times I'll go and look in the Composure source. Um, Clojure.http.client is a very small library for doing HTTP client operations. Uh, we've used that to test our web apps and also to write uh, consumers of RESTful services. Uh, Redis Clojure is a API wrapper over Redis, which is a very fast uh, key value data store. Uh, we're getting uh, on the order of a million transactions in under a minute. So that's uh, pretty bloody good. Um, and that's not really about Clojure. It's really about Redis. Uh, so if you haven't heard about this whole NoSQL movement, uh, you might want to check out things like Redis. Uh, this turned out to be a perfect fit for a project that we're working on. Uh, Redis, Redis allows you to trade off reliability of your persistence for speed, right? Because it doesn't write through immediately. And we had a project that didn't have to, you know, we actually cared so much about real timeness of data that if we had 99% of the data that got dropped into us really fast, that would be better than having 100% of it slightly slower. And so Redis was a really sweet spot for that. Um, I should also mention that. Because Clojure is mostly functional, right? that you spend very little of your time dealing with state, it's actually a really good language for dealing with out of process state. Right? Because you're not distracted by, I mean, how often is in process state in, useful anyway, really, in, in real systems? Right? In process state is something that can cause you trouble. 
Right? You, you want to get it persisted somewhere or piped on to the next process or something. Right? In process state is a pain in the ass, and Clojure just doesn't really have any. Uh, I did a, a quick survey of open source Clojure libraries, and about one line in a thousand of Clojure programs instantiates a mutable reference. So, so when you talk about you know, how much of, is the functional subset being used versus stateful programming, it really is working in the functional subset. Uh, CLJ Facebook is a wrapper for the Facebook API. Uh, if you've never worked with the Facebook API and can avoid doing it, I'd recommend uh, staying away from it. Uh, but the closure part of it has been fine. It's the Facebook that's provided all the evil uh, in that experience. Uh, Mickle is the query language for Freebase, which is uh, a, a, another uh, open source free repository of data. That has been totally great to use. Again, any pain that we've had there has been Freebase and not Clojure. A CLJ record is a port of active record to Clojure. Uh, that has been, it is much less mature than active record, obviously, which has gotten a ton of development and, and pounding on over the years. Uh, we have used this. I'm not convinced. I mean, CLJ record implies, at least at a lightweight level, the notion of mapping between databases and objects. Uh, I see this as kind of training wheels in the Clojure world because I don't really want objects, but that's really damn good training wheels because everybody on our team knows active record. And so for standing up a database app quickly, uh, you know, that was really uh, easy. There's also a set of Java libraries that are aligned with Clojure at various levels, ones that we've used that I wanted to call attention to. Uh, JLine you need if you're going to do anything at a REPL, right? JLine just gives you the ability to, you know, have nice uh, history and, and navigating back up to the, the last 500 commands you typed or whatever. Uh, Jota time, you know, is right out of Clojure's heart. Uh, it's immutable time objects, so it's very, you know, if you're doing anything in Scala or Clojure with time, it should be done with Jota time, not with the Java time APIs. And someone who keeps track of um, the, the old world of Java can probably tell you that there's a JSR that's going to get Jota into Java eventually. Um, Java 7. Yeah, there you go, Java 7, which somebody told me this morning the code name for Java 7, did you guys see that tweet go by that the code name for Java 7 was Chinese democracy? Yes. <laughs> that was funny. I didn't make that up. Um, string template is a functional templating library. So we've used this. We do not use Composure's HTML generation for web stuff. We use string template everywhere. Uh, string template doesn't allow you to do code in your views. Right? All you can do is pass maps to your views and iterate over them. So it really forces you to do that separation. But the whole purpose of views, right, to not put code in them. And it's been, you know, we, we, you know, we, we went down the active record clone path, the, the training wheels path for data. But we, we bit the functional bullet here and said, you know what, we're only going to pass maps to our views. And that's been fun. That's, that's been great. Uh, and it just works. Um, there's not a CSV parser. See, it's crazy to me that there's not like a standard for CF, CSV parsing in the Java world. Like, how many damn megabytes do you have to download when you install Java on your box and you can't parse CSV until you go and get some outside help? Uh, it would be nice to have a pure closure CSV parser. Uh, I looked at writing one for a few minutes. Nah, screw it. Um, we use Super CSV. Super CSV is not well aligned with Clojure in the sense that, um, and this is true of a lot of Java libraries, right? A lot of Java libraries are like, well, I'm going to take some data and then I'm going to convert it. I could give it to you as a map. We'll have that as like a low lying API. That's like the trivial piece to implement. And then on top of that, we're going to give you all these services about creating mutable objects. Uh, and beans, right? Oh, I've got a problem that's already solved and I've delivered the data to my app and I can process it and now I'm going to create this incredible, you know, additional level of ceremony. And so, uh, you know, I think Hibernate, for example, is an extraordinarily bad fit for Clojure. Uh, although there is uh, a Hibernate Clojure library out there, right? So, there, you know, different people have different kinds of tastes in these things. Any library questions? <coughs> The library stuff has generally been very satisfying, right? The only thing that's not satisfying is where there's a Java library that does something useful, but in a totally backwards 1990s mutable way. Uh, but it hasn't, really, it hasn't really been a big problem. Cohesion. What does it mean for something to be cohesive, right? Uh, in, in, your code is cohesive uh, if all the pieces are actually in play, right? So if you had a class and your class had three fields in it, and that class had five methods, and all five of those methods used all three of the fields, that'd be very cohesive, right? Because all the fields are relevant to all the methods. And so it's very easy to read and understand code that's cohesive in that way. Now, most of us, that's not true. 
How many of you think if you looked through uh, object-oriented code that you'd written that all of your methods would use all of the fields that they have access to? No, right? And so what happens in object-oriented systems is you drift away from cohesiveness. It's a lot harder to drift away from cohesiveness when you're doing functional programming, right? Because what would you have to do to write an uncohesive function? Right? Everything's done by arguments, right? You don't have all these objects. And so it's like, I'm going to write a function of three arguments and then I'm going to ignore the first one, right? You have to be kind of willfully stupid to, to be uncohesive. And it happens, right? You've, you've, got, you've, you've probably seen methods that ignore arguments, and certainly you can still do that in functions, right? I can write a function that ignores its arguments. But it's a lot easier to be cohesive in a functional language. But flip that around. Right? Why don't we do that in OO? You could, right? You could absolutely insist that you're going to write uh, objects in such a way that all of, your obje all of your methods only actually are completely cohesive. They only actually use the fields that they use. And you would get a lot smaller granularity of pieces to build your systems out of. And that's exactly what we found with Clojure, that we were building smaller pieces. Which on the cohesion side is good, but when you walk up to a system and it's like, well, if I walk up to an object-oriented system, I sort of have a roadmap, right? I have 10 classes, and within those classes, um, even though they're non-cohesive, they provide a grouping metaphor that, that's comforting. Uh, if you write Clojure in the way that God intended, that's not going to happen. So you have, you know, my, my program is built of 500 functions. And what is the unit of understanding those other than, oh, I have a linear list of 500 functions? I don't have a total answer to this question. Um, so part of it, obviously, is namespaces. And that's a huge start, right? So most of our projects, you know, if we had 500 functions in a project, they would probably be in 50 different namespaces. But uh, just to give a quick example of where that breaks down, um, do you have a math namespace or a trigonometry namespace? Right? And if you have a trigonometry namespace, it just has the trigonometry function that's very cohesive. But then if someone's doing a ton of math work, they're pissed off, right? Because in order to do all the different math work that they want to do, they have to import 75 different namespaces. Uh, there's actually a lot of interesting uh, hackery going on to deal with this issue. So one of the things that, that Clojure has, uh, originally from Composure and in the contrib library now, is a function called immigrate. And what immigrate does is it assembles namespaces for the convenience of the consumer. So I, as the author of code, break things down into a bunch of very fine-grained namespaces. Right? So I have you know, 100 namespaces. You, the consumer of code, are like, well, screw that. Right? I want all 20 of these all the time. And so you create a new na namespace that immigrates those 20 namespaces and makes them all available under a new name. This is a nice uh, advantage taking of namespaces. It has subtle interaction with state, it turns out. So it's, it's not perfect. The other thing that people have done, and uh, I got called out for this yesterday, um, as a poor man's strategy for thinking about this, the other thing people have done is uh, divide a namespace into multiple separate files. So physical source files provide a convenience for the developer, uh, but they don't have any real meaning. right? So that, that feels very uh, crufty. Uh, but those are you know, some of the things that we've played with. So this is a, a benefit and a challenge. And I don't, have a, I don't have a sort of full answer on this. Another piece is shipping. Right? When we want to go to production. Um, this is going to turn, I'm going to turn into an advertisement for Ruby in a Clojure talk. So I've already said that Ruby kicks everybody else's butt at testing. Uh, the other thing that the Ruby community kicks everybody else's butt uh, is at tools for automating deployment. Uh, Capistrano and Chef and things like that blow everything else out of the water. And by the way, I hope I'm wrong. I keep hoping that some red-faced attendee is going to come up to me after a talk and show me a system that's as good as that in some other language, because we'll use it. Right? I would love to see those tools be better. But because we're a mostly Ruby shop, our solution for shipping it is that we actually use the Ruby tools to manage our closure deployments. I don't think this is idiomatic, because I don't think there's an idiomatic answer. Of course, you know what the Java community that's adopting Clojure so far is using. Maven, right? So, <coughs> so there are people using Maven. I hate Maven. There, I said it in public. <coughs> but Maven's trying to solve a hard problem. Um, the other thing I've, the other, I've, I've kind of thrown two things together on the slide. There's the software, and then there's the hardware. Um, throwing things up into the cloud or up into hosting hasn't been a problem at all, right? We use. Uh, we think of ourselves as a software shop, so we never got involved with the whole, like when we started the company, I didn't want to make hosting decisions for customers. We end up making hosting decisions for almost all of our customers. 
Um, we have found uh, Contigix and Slicehost and EC2 to all be very responsive, capable, deliver value commensurate to the price, and they just work with Ruby and they've just worked with Java and Clojure. So we haven't had any problems on the hardware and OS side, you know, shipping Clojure apps. That's not been an issue. Um, I think when we first started down this road, I said, you know, it's stupid to build these tools in Clojure, right? Because if it's one place that Clojure has a weak spot, it's the JVM's weak spot, which is operate, interoperating with operating systems, right? I mean, Clojure is a crap tool for writing things that are going to control Mac OS differently from Windows, differently from Linux. And by the way, all the other JVM languages are too, because the JVM sucks at it. Right? I mean, that's, and the reason that Ruby is good at it is Ruby is completely willing to say, you know what, we have a whole bunch of functions in core that are Windows only and just blow up if you try to call them on Linux. And are Linux only and just blow up if you try to call them you know, somewhere else. And so Ruby's really good at that. Ha having said that, though, even though this is crazy, it appears to be happening. So there are tools that are closure specific for dealing with packaging and deployment and so forth uh, coming along. James Reeves, the guy that created uh, Composure, has disappeared into the woods and is not doing Composure stuff right now. He's doing something about managing deployment. Um, Phil Hagelberg, who created the Emacs Starter Kit, has also just announced a tool called Liningen, which is a build management tool for Clojure, which is up on GitHub. And um, Bradford Cross, who is the Clojure brain behind uh, Flightcaster, uh, has said that they use internally a chef-like thing that he's written in Clojure that he's going to open source. So uh, I think this is kind of irritatingly hard to do in Java, but people are going to do it. So let me summarize some pain points. Uh, I talked about test automation already. Uh, the Java ecosystem has been a pain point around Maven-y type stuff. Uh, convention over configuration has been a, a pain point. Um, Rails is great, not because of library stuff, because of all the decisions that are pre-made for you so you can just get stuff done. Uh, anytime new technology comes along, that's not going to be there yet, right? And so there are, there is a, a Rails clone in Clojure called Conjure. And so that's great. That's cool as far as it goes. But we need to have convention over configuration that's tuned to the way Clojure's cool, right? That's tuned to the functional style of Clojure. And that's going to take a while, right? Because we don't even know what the damn conventions need to be yet. And so that stuff's non-existent. And so sitting down to start on a new project, right, you have to make up conventions as you go. Uh, and, and so that, you know, that's, that's a given with anything that's, in my mind, you know, significantly new. Error messages are horrible. Uh, there was a joke on, the, uh, on Twitter the other day that this is because Rich doesn't make mistakes. So he's never actually seen the error messages that come out of Clojure. Uh, the error messages are horrible, in my experience, on all of the advanced JVM languages. I think they're horrible in JRuby. I think they're horrible in Groovy. I think they're horrible in Scala. Um, this is a problem. This is a fixable problem, so I don't get freaked out about it. Um, this is a problem that's mitigated if you're a good test-driven shop because you don't create you know, giant reams of crap that you have to sort through. Right? You make your, your mistakes in, in the small instead of in the big. Uh, living without objects is not a pain point for me. I haven't found this to be a problem. Uh, but the other folks at Relevance would probably say this is a problem, right? So that, you know, how do I design with functions uh, takes some doing, right? It's not, it's not just this automatic skill that translates over uh, from OO design. And so, uh, so that is a, an ongoing challenge. Uh, there's also a piece of this that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, I've, I've made the controversial statement, let your data be your contract, right? Your data is your contract anyway as soon as you go out of process, period. Right? As soon as you write to a database, as soon as you put something on the network, your data is your contract anyway. Right? So just go ahead and accept that and let your data be your contract. Um, Clojure certainly facilitates doing that. Right? And so the idea here is that I'm not going to build an interface and then hide the data behind it. Instead, I'm going to say, look, the data is a contract. I give you this data. And if you want to look at the data a different way, you transform it. Right? Clojure doesn't require that you work that way. Right? We can still have interface contracts. Right? You can implement Java interfaces in Clojure. Uh, although, frankly, interfaces aren't that interesting a metaphor once you go over the wire either. Right? Uh, but I, I think that, that this, uh, the, the interface contract piece of objects, uh, frankly, is irrelevant at scales bigger than a process anyway. Right? And smaller than a process, how much contract help do I need? Right? If I'm inside my own process, do I really need 75 different contracts and firewalls keeping different pieces of my process separate from each other? Uh, my answer is no. 
Uh, I understand that I am on the lunatic fringe uh, of the software development community because people look at me when I'm crazy like when I say that. So I want to be careful not to say that Clojure is mandating that. So I want to separate from what, what Clojure does, which is it enables that from what crazy person Stu is doing, which is embracing that. The rest of the Clojure community isn't necessarily embracing that. As I said, you know, the world takes all types. There are people out there making uh, Hibernate work, you know, work with Clojure and things like that. Uh, editor support is a problem. There is uh, support in Eclipse. There is support in IntelliJ IDEA. There is support in NetBeans. Um, all the serious kids use VI or Emacs. Uh, one of the critical points there, and I, I hereby officially challenge Phil Hagelberg to make the screencast that he's been saying that he's going to make, is that par edit is really important. Right? If you're scared of the parentheses, you're not going to really get Lisp until you get par edit. And I, I lived for years without par edit, and, and I only got dragged into using it by Phil Hagelberg on the Clojure IRC. And Rich wasn't using par edit either, right? They're, they're, we were out in the darkness, right? You know, uh, actually manually touching parentheses. Once you learn how to use par edit, and I don't know, what other, does anyone know other things that have par edit equivalents? I don't know, I, mean, I assume probably VI does, because everything Emacs can do, VI can do, but in an alternate well, I mean, reality kind of way. Par edit stuff on, on Rubico too. Um, it matches up on the end and, and such. Right, so, so uh, I don't want to try to explain par edit in the time that we have here, but if you've never done par edit, go and install Emacs and, and learn par edit. Uh, par edit is supposed, par, the, the idea of par edit would work with any language, and in fact, the Emacs starter kit turns on par edit when you go into the JavaScript mode, so you could use par edit with JavaScript code, but it does weird crap and doesn't seem to work. Uh, and I think you really have to have, uh, you really have to have the AST to make par edit do the right things with a language like JavaScript or Ruby. And, and so uh, it would be really cool to see par, the ideas in par edit extended up. But this is a problem, and it's going to continue to be a problem. Uh, I install Emacs whenever I start a project uh, somewhere. What is the default Emacs experience for Clojure? The default Emacs experience for Clojure is uh, go and download the Phil Hagelberg's Emacs starter kit, throw out your old .emacs file, and, and, and start a new uh, and, and live the good life. Uh, and then whether to use Slime and Swank, I would say start without it. I actually only started using Slime and Swank last night uh, after doing living for a year without it. It is cool, uh, but it, it, the, the install process for Slime and Swank is you know, a danger point. And so you're much likelier to, to be happy uh, starting without it. And if you're doing any other kind of Lisp development in Emacs, you are going to feel a real pain point trying to get it to work with both Clojure and the other Lisp. Right, you might want to you know, do an Emacs in a box thing and yeah. swap your Emacs.d out. But, but will my list muscle memory uh, in Emacs work OK if I'm a Clojure guy? Yes, yeah, it's, that's, that's mostly good. So uh, I'm going to flip over to pleasure points. That was pain points. So the libraries have been a pleasure, uh, particularly on the point of readability. Now, it's very easy to jump to source in Clojure code. Uh, I got really spoiled as a Ruby programmer because a lot of the libraries we use are very easy to read. And so you get used to going and reading libraries instead of looking at docs. That has continued and, in fact, is, is better even, I would say, in Clojure. Uh, destructuring is really cool. So destructuring is a, uh, a way of uh, getting your arguments into a function that says, I want to break apart the things that have been passed in and get just the part that I need bound to a name. Uh, that has been surprisingly useful. Uh, uh, the metadata piece, you know, you don't need it until you need it, and then all of a sudden it's extremely cool. So Clojure's metadata is just Clojure data, right? There's a very, there's a, you know, this is a Lisp thing, right? There's great uniformity, right? You have Clojure data, and then Clojure code is just Clojure data, and then Clojure metadata is just metadata again, right? Contrast that, say, with the Java world of annotations as a sort of lightweight, poor man's alternate syntax, high ceremony metadata. Uh, the metadata has been really nice. Uh, Multi-methods are Clojure's uh, generalization of polymorphism. Uh, when I wrote the book, I didn't use multi-methods very much, and I actually surveyed the Clojure code that was publicly visible out on GitHub and concluded that other people don't use multi-methods very much. We use multi-methods all the time. And now that we're shipping code, we use multi-methods very heavily. Uh, it's a powerful abstraction. Uh, macros, uh, list macros are list macros, right? If you want metaprogramming, you eventually want something like a macro system. Uh, the reference types, so the whole state management thing has been incredibly easy. Uh, that is, I mean, really, that is the signature feature of Clojure that's getting its attention right now, is the approach to state and the approach to these reference types. And none of the developers have had any trouble with that. 
right? The whole, you know, building things out of functions instead of objects has been a challenge, but the using the reference types has been absolutely easy. Uh, doing data conversion to functional language, so taking data from one format to another, right? You spend all this time doing design patterns in the OO world where it's really like, you know, class on top of class on top of class on top of class. That stuff just falls away. That's been great. Uh, the REPL has been great, so the interactive development environment has been uh, the equal of what we've had in other languages. Uh, Part I already mentioned. Namespaces have been really cool. I, I didn't realize how much the module and class notion of namespaces in Ruby sucked uh, until doing closure stuff for us. So I really like uh, the way namespaces work and really, you know, and really in some ways this is about orthogonality, right? That, that uh, in Ruby we repurpose classes and modules to do namespace stuff. And so we drag things in. And that works, right? The, the, the thing about Ruby is that it's beautifully tasteful hackery, right? It's, it's, it's sort of my summary of, of, of Ruby. It's beautifully tasteful hackery. And whenever there's a problem, there's a beautifully tasteful hack for solving it. Uh, Lisp is, uh, you know, enclosure among it is more of a let's be tasteful uh, from the ground up so we need less hackery, right? Which is a very hard promise to deliver on. Uh, but namespaces, you know, a lot of these things are in fact that, right? Namespaces are carving out and solving a problem that gets folded into other things in languages. Uh, Multi-methods are carving out dispatch as a separate problem and saying we're not going to solve this on our objects, we're not going to solve this on our verbs, we're going to solve this somewhere else. And a lot of times I in fact describe this as a la carte programming, right? That you have uh, with Clojure a set of very small honed tools that you put together. It does require that you come to the game knowing what you want to do. Right? Clojure is not going to hold you by the hand and say, oh, the answer to your problem is object. Right? Which OO does that a lot. Right? What's your problem? Oh, I don't even have to listen. The answer to your problem is object. Right? The answer to your problem in Clojure is going to be a lot of different things. And so to sum up the, sort of the, the difference between the pain points and the pleasure points, uh, we do two-week iterations on our Agile projects. And uh, on one two-week iteration, we'll do a retrospective where we look back on the project. And on the next iteration, we do a prospective, a risk assessment where we look forward. When we started putting closure on our projects, you can bet that it was featured in the risk assessment meeting. You know, Dear customer, uh, we're using a new language, and we're going to put that on the risk assessment meeting. Uh, we've removed closure from the risk checklist at customer request on all the projects. So uh, you know, in terms of overall red light, yellow light, green light on using it on projects, um, it's been green lighted. Uh, on, on all the stuff that we've done, and it has fallen off the list, right? It's, it's gone to regular, you complain about it like you complain about lunchroom food level of, uh, you know, worry on projects. There are problems, right? There are things that are, you know, sharp edges and irritants, and it's a tool that we use now. Uh, we don't use it for everything. Uh, I would argue that sort of counter to what you might think, the real sweet spots for closure uh, are any application that deals with out-of-process state. Right? Because with Clojure, the in-process state problem is not in your face anymore. Right? You're dealing with functions, and you can just work without a process state and be done. Uh, of course, almost everything we write is out of process state. Uh, the weak spot for Clojure right now is anywhere where there's a really strong convention over configuration solution on some other platform. Right? So if something is right up Rails grill, right? you know, this is a you know, Rails web app you could bang out in you know, five days. Uh, then there's going to be conventions that just don't exist in the closure world. Uh, and, and I think that's a really broad sweet spot, right? All applications that deal with state out of process, <laughs> that's a really broad sweet spot. But it's also a very important sour spot in terms of, uh, you know, the convention over configuration piece. And so, you know, where a library sort of almost solves the problem. And we went through the exact same transition to Ruby in 2005 at Relevance, right? That, you know, what's the sweet spot for Ruby? Uh, applications? Right? Uh, and what's the sour spot? Well, something where the problem is already solved by a library you know, or a framework that, you know, that, that most of the work is already done and you're not actually writing much code. And that's in general true. right? You want the sharpest tool possible if you actually need a tool. Right? Clojure is an extremely sharp tool. If you don't need a tool at all, then it doesn't really matter. right? You know, pick the solution that, that already solves the problem. So as I mentioned before, uh, this presentation plus the much longer technical presentation, the 200 slides of how to actually do stuff uh, are online. The other URL that's not up here that I'll just rely on your Google foo for, if you really want to get the zen of what's different about Clojure, go and watch Rich Hickey's two talks that are up on the InfoQ website. Uh, the most recent one was from the JVM Language Summit that's just been posted, and then there was one uh, shortly before that. But if you go on to InfoQ and, and look for Rich Hickey's name, uh, 
I think that if the, as a software developer, if you have only one hour to improve yourself in 2010, watching one of those two videos would not be a poor choice uh, of how to do it. And with that, uh, I'm going to take uh, five minutes worth of questions, and then we will break for lunch, 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 and then we will break for lunch.